Okay, again, welcome to everyone. Um, for those who are just joining, my name is Christy Morley and I am the Senior Naturalist here at Wissahick and Trails. Uh, and I welcome you to our presentation on Birding 101 this evening. Um, if you didn't hear my last announcement, please make sure your microphones are muted and stay muted. Um, I will use the chat box for questions and I will stop several times throughout the course of the presentation to uh, look at those questions and, and try to give some answers. Um, I know that there's the potential for a lot of people to be on this recording. So if I don't get through all the questions, I will save the chat box and I will answer them um, in a Word document or an email uh, after the meeting is over. Um, so just you know, hang tight if I don't get to your question, um, but I will do my best uh, through the course of this evening. So away we go into Birding 101. Um, for those who are not familiar with us, we are an environmental nonprofit based in Ambler, Pennsylvania. Uh, we were founded a little over 60 years ago to really protect the land and the water of the Wissahickon Creek. Um, to date, we have protected about 1,300 acres of land from development and we manage 12 nature preserves and approximately 24 miles of trails. Uh, I know from the registrations that there were a lot of our current supporters um, that were gonna join us this evening. And I thank you very much. We do depend on um, the support, your support um, to keep furthering our mission. And if you're not currently a supporter of our work, um, please go on our website and take a sort of a deeper look at a lot of the things that we have going on. and um, Hopefully you will feel so compelled to become a supporter as well. So just a bit about the outline for how I'm gonna cover this evening. I'm gonna go through a couple slides sort of, I put in the category of getting started um, in birding and some basic things. And then a little bit deeper dive into the keys around bird identifications, um, a discussion of field guides and apps that you might wanna use. Um, a brief discussion about choosing and using binoculars, and then at the very end, wrap up with a discussion about, excuse me, some very general discussion about um, bird-friendly backyards and setting up feeding stations. And as I said, I will stop a couple times for questions, so please feel free to type them into the chat box as I'm speaking. Uh, and then when I stop, I will go ahead and go look at that um, and see if there's any, any questions. So for the most part tonight, I am going to use birds that are found in our area as examples. So right around, you know, southeastern Pennsylvania, around the Philadelphia area, and more specifically um, in the Wissahickon Valley watershed. And so I just wanted to give you a sense of, if you're not familiar with, how many birds are we actually talking about? Um, and so you can see here that um, in the whole American Birding Association area, which is basically the United States and Canada and Hawaii, um, there's about 1,100 species of birds total. Um, in Pennsylvania, there's about 418. Uh, in Montgomery County, we dropped that number to about 309. Um, and then in the Wissahickon Valley watershed, we're at around a little over 200. Um, but the reality is, it's so my point here is, is that it's really helpful to know, and we're gonna talk more in depth about this, but it's really helpful to know what the possibilities are um, as you're starting to learn to bird and starting to try to put identifications to birds you're not familiar with. Because knowing what's in the area is gonna help you narrow that list that you have to pick from. Um, and so even in this 221 species, um, some of these are very common birds, like the American robin, and some of them are uncommon, like the winter wren, for example. Um, some are very habitat specific, like a duck on a pond, and, and, and someplace somebody that needs water, um, and others are more general, like a lot of the birds that live in our backyards. And some are really only here in certain seasons. 
So the reality is, is that any given day that we go out to bird, this potential list is much less than this 221 species, which really helps us sort of narrow in on what might be around for us to see. So, but before we get to figuring out exactly how, how to figure out what's out there um, and help guide your efforts in terms of identification, I wanna take a minute to talk about um, the birder's best friend. And besides your binoculars, um, a notebook and a pencil in your pocket are actually probably one of the key pieces of equipment that you can have, especially as you're starting out in birding and birding and bird identification. So I really highly encourage you um, to make notes and sketches about the birds that you don't know uh, when you're out in the field. Because as I'm sure you're aware already, birds don't always sit still. And while you're fumbling through the field guide, trying to find the right page and trying to find the birds to match that too that you're seeing, that bird is very likely to fly away, dive into deeper cover, never to be seen again <laughs> while you're in the field. And so you're now stuck with a field guide open to six pages of little brown birds and you still have no idea what you just saw. So your sketches do not have to be masterpieces. Um, these are two sketches from way back in 1999 when I was starting out birding, um, trying to figure out what these species were. And you can see they're not great drawings, just a generic bird shape and then lots of arrows and notes about what I was seeing. And those are the kinds of things that can really help you um, key in on. And we'll talk more about field marks later, but putting it down on a drawing like this or a basic sketch and diagramming it out is gonna help you key in on those important things that you're seeing on a bird. Um, and so when it flies away, you won't be left saying, wait, did it have an eye ring? Or what color were its legs? As you're looking at those six little brown birds on the page in your field guide. The other thing that you might wanna note, and you probably should note if you have the opportunity, is any behaviors that the bird is doing. So you'll notice down here um, at the bottom of this drawing, it says foraging off surface, spinning around. And this bird, the Wilson Stalarope, that's spinning around, it literally spins in a circle and it stirs up food from the bottom um, the, of what it's standing on in, in the water. Those, that's a key behavior that helped me figure out exactly what this bird was. And so noting those behaviors can be just as important as noting the actual field marks that you're seeing. And for those who are not familiar, these are what these birds actually look like. Um, so it was, you know, these, these sketches were successful for me in terms of trying to figure out what these birds actually were. I have another, another number of sketches around the same time in my notebook that I still don't know what bird I was trying to identify because I didn't take good enough notes while I was looking at the bird. So I have a couple of possibilities, but I'm still not sure exactly what bird I was seeing. Um, see something in the chat here. Okay, I'm going to come back to that in a second. Um, so another approach to this is actually to talk it out when you're in the field. If we say things out loud, it helps our brain remember them later. So if you don't feel confident enough to try and sketch something and hold your binoculars and that's just a little too much juggling, which is understandable, say it out loud, say what you're seeing. So imagine I was looking at a bird in my front yard and I might say something like the following as I'm looking at it through my binoculars. I see a medium sized bird hopping on the grass. It's kind of gray, brownish black on top. The head is a darker black than the back is. It's got a yellow bill. It cocks its head sideways at the grass like it's listening. Um, it's got white around the eye, but it doesn't look like it's a complete circle. There's kind of like white patches almost. Um, it's got yellow legs, it's got white under the tail, and it's got a rusty red belly. And probably by that last clue, most of you now realize that yes, I am talking about an American Robin. And if I'd led with the rusty red belly and the black back, you probably would have known what I was talking about as well. 
But my point is to show you that there's a lot more detail about that bird and a common bird that we're probably very, very familiar with. Um, that unless we take the time to slow down to pay attention to even the common birds, there's so much more detail there that we can see. And learning that for the common birds that we have um, in our backyards or in a local park or even out of our office window sometimes when we need a break, um, those are the kinds of things that are going to, that practice is going to help prepare you for new birds that you aren't as familiar with. Sorry, my slides are not advancing here. So hold on, technical difficulties. There we go, okay. So one of the ways that we can do that then help us ultimately is to figure out what you are likely to see. So the first thing that you wanna ask yourself when you're trying to figure out any kind of bird is where and when are you? Um, all field guides have a range map that is color coded to the seasonality of each species. So in a gen and they're and they're wide in a general area. Most of them are going to cover, you know, the better part of the United States and Canada. Um, some birds with much smaller ranges may only have, like birds that are only found in southern Texas or southeast Arizona, may only have, you know, that portion of the map of the United States um, in their field guide because they're so localized. But a lot of birds are going to have at least the eastern half of the United States or more than likely um, the whole United States that we can see. And they're all color coded. So the blue here generally is, uh, this is the bird's wintering range. Purple, which this particular bird has a really small purple range, but that's usually means year round. So in the winter or in the breeding season, this dark orange generally represents breeding season and the lighter yellow is migration. So if you're in Minnesota, for example, you are only likely to see this bird during migration unless you live in the very northeastern part of Minnesota. Here in Pennsylvania, where we are down in this little tiny corner here, excuse me, we would only see this bird in the winter. But this bird does breed in Pennsylvania. This bird is actually a winter wren, and I apologize, I didn't put a picture in here. Um, it's a small wren. And we can only see it here in the winter, um, but it does breed in Pennsylvania. But you can see that this map is not very specific. So it's a good start and it gives us an idea of where things might be and kind of what season we might see them in. But if we wanna get more particular about where a bird might be, um, we can turn to what I'm gonna call site specific guides. So a lot of places that are known for birding or, you know, want to communicate to birders that they have trails to walk on for birds and things like that, often publish, publish these lists, like these checklists. So this is an example of the birds of Fort Washington State Park. This checklist is available online um, through the Wincote Audubon Society. It's a PDF. You can go download it yourself. And this is actually going to be a list that's relatively useful for most of the area here. Um, some birds are very specific to Fort Washington State Park, um, but overall, these are the kinds of birds that you're likely to see here. And so these kinds of checklists are generally organized by species, so a species list, and then the four seasons are columned out here, spring, summer, fall, and winter, and then it's a measure of sort of occurrence um, or likelihood of seeing the birds. So they often are noted as um, abundant or, or common, occasional or rare, or they might have a blank so that, you know, the, you don't, you're not going to see that bird in that season at all um, if it's got a blank there. So that gets us a little bit more detailed information. And then the last way that we can get sort of really detailed information is to use eBird online. Um, and for those who aren't familiar, eBird is a free online system that birders use to um, enter their sightings from a given bird walk. And it's all based on hotspots, so locations. So I'm at our headquarters office right now on Morris Road, 
um, and it's the Four Mills Nature Reserve, and that is actually a hot spot on eBird. And all of our preserves are hot spots on eBird. Fort Washington State Park is a hot spot, so you get the idea. Um, but you can go on to their explore feature on eBird and look at those hot spots in the area. You can zoom in a map to see what hot spots are in your area if you're not right here. So say you're visiting family up in, you know, New York State or Maine or California and you want to see where some good birding spots are around you, you can zoom in on that eBird map and pull, look at the hot spots and see what birds are there. And you can view these bar graphs like this. So this is some ducks. Um, this is actually from John Heinz National Wildlife Refuge down near the airport. Um, and this again gives you an idea of the seasonality of the birds. So mallards, for example, this big solid green bar here are seen all year round there. Um, but gadwalls, an, another kind of duck, for example, uh, really migrate out of here in um, the end of April and go breed someplace else and then come back starting late August and into September and then their numbers build over the winter. So they're a bird that we would really expect to see over the winter here and not in the summer. And so all of those kinds of things are going to help you sort of figure out either before you go out what you might be likely to see or as you're looking at um, possibilities in a field guide or on a checklist and things like that, it's gonna help you narrow down to know, well, hey, wait, I'm in July. It's really unlikely that I'm seeing a gadwall. Maybe I need to think again about what kind of duck I'm really looking at and pay attention to some of those other features. And so again, it's just something that's gonna help you um, do that. I'm not really gonna talk about eBird any more than this. So if learning about eBird and using eBird, um, which is a really useful tool for birders in a lot of different ways, if it's something that you're interested in, please either put it in the chat box or send me an email afterwards and it may be something that I can add as uh, a program um, if enough people are interested in that uh, so people can learn more about how to use eBird um, specifically. So I'm gonna, I don't have a slide built in here, but I am gonna stop for a quick second and see if we've got any questions in the chat. Um, rough percentage of time that an intermediate or experienced birder will identify an unknown bird. Will you generally always be able to identify it? <sighs> you know, that's a really tough one. Um, I'm gonna say it depends on the bird, to be honest with you. So if you're looking at something in um, the warbler family, for example, or you know warbler related birds, overall, I would say if you're paying attention to um, the things that we're gonna talk about and learning about field marks and things like that, probably a lot of the time you will be able to identify an un 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 and unknown bird. Uh, if you're talking about sparrows or gulls, for example, um, or flying hawks, then it becomes a little bit more difficult. Um, and so what I generally tell people is to try to look at um, getting it to, if you can't identify it, completely and you're not totally 100% sure, try to get it to two or three options and then pay attention to what the differences are. And we'll talk a little bit about some of this as we move forward, but pay attention to what the differences are between those two or three things so that the next time that you're in the field, you can pay it, you know, you can kind of see those. Um, Somebody says, is there a tool to identify birds by their sound and song? Yes, the, somebody else answered, song sleuth is an option. Um, I'm not going to really talk about songs tonight too much because I did a workshop on that a couple of weeks ago, which is already on our website. So you can go and um, look at that. I will say for those who are interested, Song Sleuth can be helpful. It's an app you put on your phone, but you actually have to make a recording of the bird and sometimes it doesn't work very well. Um, if you can get a really clear recording, it can be really helpful. But I cover in my other workshop some other techniques for learning bird song, and we will talk about that in uh, just a bit. 
So I'm going to close the chat for the moment and I will come back uh, to more questions uh, at the end of this section. So now I'm gonna sort of dive into this nitty gritty of bird identification. So you, now you've done a little bit of homework and you kind of got an idea about what birds might be found in your area and you're probably really excited and you think, oh, it's you know the second week of May and there's all these warblers out there and they're gorgeous and I wanna go see them all and I need to know where to find them and I've used eBird and I'm like ready to go. So how do we take it to the next level about identifying birds? And what we're really going to do is dive into, sorry, again, I'm like, I have this lag with my slides advancing, my apologies. Um, the, what I'm calling the four keys of bird identification, so habitat, behavior, size and shape, color and pattern. And then we're going to add to that field marks and songs and calls. And then one thing that is useful um, as you're thinking about bird identification is birds are really built for what they do as a species. And kind of every part of the bird that you're looking at is a clue of sort of what it is, how to categorize it, and how we categorize it is gonna help us figure out how to identify it. So like, for example, this turkey vulture here on the lower left, it's got big broad wings for soaring in the air. We're not likely to see that bird floating in a pond unless something is dramatically wrong with that bird. Whereas the green heron up here in the top right is designed as a wading bird. It's got long legs to get it through the water. It's got a beak that's designed for stabbing. It's got eyes that are kind of positioned down so that it's looking at the water. Um, the white-throated sparrow here is designed for seed eating with this kind of bill um, versus the hummingbird with the long narrow bill to get into flowers to get the nectar. And so all of those kinds of things are gonna help us put that bird in a category, which is gonna help us figure out what it is and where we should look for more information in our field guides, for example. So the first thing that we wanna think about, and we already kind of touched on this, but I wanna bring in a very specific example here is the idea of habitat. And so we talk generally about where are you? So, you know, are you in Pennsylvania or are you in California? Um, and that's gonna impact the, the birds that you have to pick from. So we're out in the field and we see a small bird with a small brown bird with a rufous cap which could be any one of these four birds. Um, and you know from your prior experience that, you know, this probably is some kind of a sparrow. It looks like a sparrow. It's just, it, you know, you've looked at your field guides ahead of time and you know, okay, a lot of little brown birds fall into that sparrow category. So I'm gonna start there. And you open your field guide and then yes, you're faced with this page of, you know, five or six different kinds of birds with brown and rufous caps. Um, and this is where getting to that very specific habitat of where you are and thinking about what your bird is doing. So again, are you in Pennsylvania or California? Um, are you in, is it June? In which case this bird in the top left here, which is an American tree sparrow, is not at all likely to be in our area. If it's December, then maybe you wanna consider that American tree sparrow and look more closely at the field guide um, for information about that bird. If you're standing in the middle of the marsh, it's much more likely and more probable that this bird over here on the top right, the swamp sparrow, is what you're looking at. Versus standing in a meadow where you might have this bird on the lower left, a field sparrow, um, not so much likely to be found in a marsh. So those very specific details of habitat are going to be important. Um, this cute little guy over here on the right, lower right, this is actually one of my favorite sparrows. This is a chipping sparrow. And this is just as likely to be found in your front yard as a robin is actually. Um, but they're a little secretive and they kind of hide. And so you may not know that they're there unless you're looking for them. And so again, getting to that very specific habitat locale where you are is going to help you narrow down those choices in a field guide. Um, the other thing that we wanna look at is behavior. And I chose the a specific example here of posture 
Um, these are two very similar sort of looking orange, greenish, drab, gray kind of birds with white wing bars. So these white areas here on the edges of their wings. And what do I do? How do I categorize these? Excuse me. And so we can look just seeing right here that they have very different postures. This one's kind of more horizontal along the branch and this one's more upright. And that actually feeds into their behaviors of how they feed. And so if we were able to watch these birds actually feeding, we would see that this one here that's horizontal along the branch tends to stay on the branch and walks up and down the branches and picks um, insects off of the bottom of leaves or finds spider webs and things like that. Whereas the one on the right is actually more likely to leave the branch to feed. It's going to fly out and catch bugs in the air. So this small one here that's horizontal is a um, pine warbler. And this bird here on the right is an Acadian flycatcher. And so that name, flycatcher, gives us a hint as to its behavior as well. So again, when I was saying in the beginning about taking notes about behaviors, this is the kind of thing that's important. If you're not sure what it is, but you know that it's staying on the branch and picking things off the branch, that's an important behavior to write down. Um, if you see that it's sitting upright or um, does it hop versus walking? So all of these kinds of things, movement, flight patterns, um, feeding style, and flocking behaviors are also things to pay attention to and are going to help you make that um, positive identification. So for movement, does it hop or does it walk? because some birds actually walk in the grass or you know, on land in the water, some hop, and that can help us sort out. Um, flight pattern can be really helpful. Nothing that we have around here flaps as slowly as a great blue heron in flight. So even if you can't see anything but the movement of the wings, I can almost guarantee that if you're paying attention, you will know that that is a great blue heron in flight because there's just nothing else that moves that slow. Compare that to the frantic flight of a chimney swift um, that just never stops moving when it's in the air. And if you're not familiar with them, I encourage you to go online and look at what a chimney swift looks like because they're probably in your neighborhood. You may just not have seen them before. Um, but they're just very frenetic flyers. And so those are the kinds of things. Those are two very extreme differences, but you know, those subtle differences in between um, how hawks fly and identifying hawks in flight has a lot to do with how they hold their wings and the shape of their body when they're in flight, as much as it does about field marks about them. Um, as I said, feeding style can be really, um, helpful, and then flocking behaviors as well. So if you see a group of noisy yellow birds at the top of a tree, it is much more likely to be a flock of American goldfinches than it is to be a flock of yellow warblers, because yellow warblers just don't display that kind of flocking behavior that American goldfinches might. And so paying attention to those things are going to help you, again, um, put those things in categories that help you figure it out. The other thing, so shape is another thing. So we've talked about, let me do my checklist here. We've talked about, what we talked about? We've talked about habitat and behavior. So now we're going to talk about um, shape and size. And one of the things that can help us is to become familiar with silhouettes. So I'm going to leave these, these um, five birds here for just a few seconds. And I want everybody, um, you don't have to answer this out loud or unmute yourself or anything like that, but for yourself, see if you know what those five birds are and just make a mental note of what they are. Okay, so I'm gonna, I will say these are all very common birds in our area. So I'm gonna put their names and their color pictures up. Um, how'd you do? I bet you probably a lot of you got close if you didn't get the exact species. So you probably knew that this one up here was a heron or an egret, um, or were able to guess that. Um, you may have been able to guess that this one was a swallow, 
uh, but not necessarily a barn swallow. And that's good because that still gets you into that general category. So now you, you have an idea, okay, this one is a wading bird. I know that. I need to go look with the wading birds in a field guide to try to figure out exactly which one it is. Excuse me. Um, but shapes of common birds can really help us learn. So pay attention to silhouettes. We don't always see birds in good light. Oftentimes they're backlit, so all we see is a silhouette. Um, sometimes if we're in deeper woods or it's early in the morning or at dusk, there's not a lot of light, so the colors in them sort of disappear, and we have to start looking at shape and pattern and behavior um, as well as a part of that. So, excuse me, study the silhouettes of the birds, you know, look at birds in not great light and see if you can um, figure out what they are. The other thing about size is <laughs> size is really hard for human beings to judge. Most of us are not good at, if somebody says two feet, being able to know what that is, um, let alone the difference between six inches or eight inches on a bird that we're looking at magnified through our binoculars. So size becomes a relative thing in the field. Um, don't think in terms of millimeters or inches, but think in terms of sparrow size or crow size. And so create this scale in your head of birds you know. And so here's four relatively common, well, sort of common birds. Um, the one down here at the bottom is a house sparrow, uh, then a robin. This is actually a raven. Actually, I think this is supposed to be a crow. That picture looks like a raven. And then um, a, a Canada goose. So it kind of gives you a spectrum of sizes. And then you can start to judge birds um, against each other, if you will, rather than trying to think in absolutes of this bird is six inches or this bird is eight inches. So sometimes you need to reference two birds to pinpoint the size. So if we're talking about a cedar waxwing, we can say, well, it's what I saw was bigger than a house sparrow, but it was smaller than Amer an American robin. Or a blue jay, for example, is bigger than an American robin, but it's smaller than an American crow. And again, this is what these two birds look like um, in their colored forms. Um, the cedar waxwing, who we're gonna visit with a little bit more detail later, uh, and then the blue jay. Um, and size can also be helpful when, sort of this relative size can be helpful when you compare an unknown bird with a familiar bird. So we, have a lot of American goldfinches. If you have a feeding station in your backyard, you probably have American goldfinches visiting. And they're a bird that we're fairly, probably fairly familiar with because we can see them quite easily. Um, but they're a bird that's got yellow and black and white on them. Well, what if we see another bird that's got yellow and black and white on it? Um, like this evening grosbeak here. And again, if you look at them closely, you're probably not likely to confuse them. But if you don't know what the grosbeak is, you think, oh, wow, yellow black bird, okay. But the reality is, and I apologize for the pictures because it's hard to find pictures to put into a presentation in terms of scale. The reality is, is that the American goldfinch is about house sparrow size, maybe even a little bit smaller than a house sparrow, um, if you put them side by side. An evening grosbeak is actually um, slightly larger than a robin. So they're a much bigger bird. And that would be big enough that you would be able to see that difference um, when you were looking at them in the field. And so be able to categorize it and say, yeah, no, it's, it's robin size, not house sparrow size. And then continue down the road of trying to um, ID that bird. And all of these kinds of tools are really designed to help you think about what you're seeing and put it into a context that makes sense to you and that you can compare things to things you know. So you can compare unknowns to knowns, which is why I suggest that you learn and study those birds that you see very frequently in your yard or in a park that you visit all the time, because those are gonna help you build those mechanisms for comparison in your brain. And it's going to make it a lot easier, and we'll talk more about this later, but it's going to make it a lot easier to um, than just trying to learn field marks all the time. Because 
sometimes you don't need those field marks. You can identify things without getting down to that very nitty gritty level of whether a bird has a wing bar or an eye ring. And by doing things like size comparisons and thinking about habitat and birding by probability um, of season and location, um, those are all things that are really gonna help you um, and make it a little bit easier to identify a bird. The other thing that we can do with bird birds is we can measure the bird against itself in terms of size. So a really good um, study in this, if you will, is this bird here. And it's closely related relative that we have in our area. Um, this bird can either be a downy woodpecker or a hairy woodpecker. And a lot of people aren't sure how to tell the difference between the two, because when you look at them in the field guide, they look pretty much identical. Uh, and they really are. But one of the things that we can do is we can actually measure the bird against itself. And so over here on the left hand side is the downy woodpecker, which is the smaller of the two. And you can see the way that this is shown here is that it's bill. If you could pick up its bill and lay it on top of its head, it's only about half the size of its head. Whereas the hairy woodpecker, its bill is almost as big as its head. So you kind of have to mentally superimpose that bill over the bird's head. And I know it sounds weird, but it's something that you can practice doing. Um, as you see these birds, there's a couple of shorebirds um, that this actually helps with greater and ye lesser yellow legs. It's the same kind of thing. One has a bill that's half the size of his head and the other one has a bill that's as big as its head. And those are the kinds of things that are gonna help us sort out very similar birds. So when I do this live and in person, I ask the class what bird this is. And I get mixed responses. When I show this, I say, does anybody want to change uh, their assessment? And some people will say, yeah, and some people won't. But generally, it's about 50-50 think this is a downy woodpecker or, this, or the other 50% think this is a hairy woodpecker. The bird that I showed you first, this one here on the right, is actually a hairy woodpecker. And you can see the difference in the size of the bill of this downy woodpecker. It is much smaller. The bird itself is smaller. Um, and it's got a very, very tiny bill relative to the size of its head versus this uh, hairy woodpecker over here. So you, it, it is really something that you can see. Um, this only works for a couple of birds, but the idea of measuring the bird against itself is, things, is something that um, really helps. The other thing that can help us think about size um, in terms of identification is also, and I don't have really good examples for all of these, but things like how long are the legs? Um, can you see the legs when the bird is sitting or standing? Um, some very small shorebirds, you, they're so little you can hardly see the legs when they're standing, even when they're standing up. Um, versus, you know, obviously the great blue heron, which, which has legs that are, you know, almost three feet in the air. So it's it, how long are the legs? How long is the neck? Um, if you can see the neck, how far the tail extends past the body. So these feathers, and I hope everybody can see this, but I'm going to point to the downy, uh, the hairy woodpecker over here on the right hand side. These long feathers here at the end of the bird, these are the tail feathers. And so in some birds, these tail feathers can be really, really long. And in some birds, in some species of birds, these tail feathers are really short and they almost end right where the bird ends, if you will. Um, woodpeckers have rather relatively long tails and they're stiff because that's how they use to help balance themselves on the tree um, when they're pecking at the, the wood. Um, and so that tail length can be a, a helpful indicator as well. The other thing that, and we're going to talk more about the feather types um, in detail in a bit, but these feathers here are the folded feathers of the wing and one for some species of birds, how long these wing feathers lay over the tail can be 
uh, a useful indicator of the species. In some birds, these flight feathers are actually longer than the tail is. And in other cases like this woodpecker, the flight feathers are relatively short compared to the length of the tail. So again, it's those level of details that when you start to get really down into the nitty gritty of trying to pick out particularly difficult species from each other. So like sorting out downy woodpeckers from a hairy woodpeckers, you have to go that far down um, and, and get to that level of detail. The other thing that we can do is to look for patterns, colors and patterns. So light and dark. Now, seen, I'm gonna put all four of these up, seen up close um, and in good light, we're probably not likely to mistake any of these birds for another one of the birds on the page here. Um, but the point here is, is that a lot of times we don't see birds in good light. Sometimes they're far away. Uh, light at the beginning of the day and the end of the day, like I said, can wash out colors, so they're hard to see. Distance washes out colors, tree cover washes out colors, all of those kinds of things. So learning to see that pattern of light and dark can also help us um, make identification. So this bird in the top left up here is actually a ring neck duck, and um, it is a dark duck with a pale patch on its side. Whereas the Northern Shoveler to the right here is really a white duck with a rusty patch, dark patch on its side. So they kind of have opposite light and dark. Uh, and so that can be something that from a distance might be easier to see than the specifics of the bills, which are shaped very differently, yes, but they both have dark heads. And so from a distance, these are going to be, the patterns of light and dark are going to be much easier to see. Excuse me. And lots of birds like this dark-eyed junco have dark on the top and white on the bottom, which helps um, protect them from predators, makes them a little bit more difficult to see. But in contrast to that, the bobolink actually has all of his white on the top and his dark on the bottom. And again, up close, we're not likely to mistake one of these birds for the other, but it can just help us to learn to key into where are the patterns of dark and light on a given bird that we're looking for, because that's gonna help us um, pinpoint that identification. Uh, the other thing that in, color, in terms of color and pattern that we might want to pay attention to are things like bold versus faint. So I'm going to use the example here of house finches and purple finches. And the house finches, which are these two birds on the left-hand side, are birds that we see here all year round. Purple finches, on the other hand, are birds that are occasionally here in the winter. Um, and not every winter do we see them. In fact, there really weren't very many here this past winter. They're a bird that um, erupts, which means they only come down in numbers um, every several years for the most part, and, and we see them scattered in the winter, but never in as many numbers as we see house finches. But we can, they, uh, they can be very confusing, and often the field guides look, the field guide pictures look very, very similar if you're not paying attention to the very subtle differences between them. And so here we wanna look for the bold versus the faint of the streaking. And the streaking really only is what matters in this case. So if we start with a male house finch up here in the upper left corner, you can see that his streaks going down his belly um, and across his sides are very, very dark. Whereas the female house finch down here kind of has lighter streaks. She's got them higher up on her neck because she doesn't have the color there, but they're much lighter than his are. But if we look at the purple finches, the male purple finch hardly has any streaks on his side. Um, his streaking is almost from his, part of his red color. Whereas his mate, the female, purple finch has much, much darker streaks, this big white eyebrow and much darker streaks underneath. So the color almost doesn't even matter 
um, at this point. What, you, what really helps you tell them apart is that level of streaking. And that can be a really good key. Um, and as I mentioned, this is really also for us here, a case of where and when are you. Um, house finches are gonna be here all year round. Purple finches only occasionally in the winter. Um, and another thing about purple finches is they're, they tend not to like very urban areas. So if you're more of an in-town kind of a person and that's where your feeding station is set up, you're probably actually unlikely to see very many purple finches. Um, but someplace that's a little bit more um, sort of a nature preserve -y kind of area that has a feeding station set up um, that's not sort of right in town is much more likely to attract purple finches. Or if you have a house that's, you know, a little bit on the outskirts of town with a little bit more property or space around it um, from the other houses, then the purple finches may come to your feeders. So, and again, that's not a hard and fast rule, but sort of in general, that, that very specific sort of micro habitat as well as the time of the year really matters uh, in terms of identification. And I know a lot of people want to key in on the red of the purple finch versus the red of the house finch. And they are actually very different. And once you've seen them in person, you will know that they're different. Um, but until you actually see them, it can be hard to just use the field guide picture to do that. Um, and it doesn't help that the house finches that we see all the time actually have an incredible amount of variability to their color. Some of them are much more light red, almost pink, like the purple finches. Uh, some of them have more, a little bit more red on the back. Some of them are almost orange. Some of them are almost as red as a cardinal. There's just an incredible amount of variability um, in male house finches but they all have this streaking on the sides. And so that's what you really wanna key in on if you think, oh wait, maybe I have a purple finch. Look at the sides and the belly of the bird and see where the streaking is. And that's gonna really help you um, figure that out. And then from a color standpoint, we have our absolutely outrageously colorful birds. And these are the birds that um, possibly got you into bird watching in the first place or are birds that you've seen a picture of and are like I want to see that in person if you're not you know a very serious birder now and and want to know where you can go see those and and it's this riot of color um, that is possible and a lot of these birds are so the question earlier you know how common is it um, to identify a bird that you're not familiar with I can almost guarantee you that if you saw any of these birds in the field, you would be able to identify them with the use of a field guide or some tool to help you uh, make that identification. These are pretty, pretty distinctly colored birds, very bright, um, very distinctive. However, <laughs> these are all male birds. And if we put their female counterparts up, all of a sudden color doesn't matter anymore. Um, and what we have to start relying on those secondary field marks and fall back on those other clues that we talked about, like behaviors um, or bill size and shape, some of their, how are they feeding, those kinds of things. And field marks like eyebrows and wing bars, which we're gonna talk about in more detail. So just so that everybody knows what these birds are, if you're not familiar, I'm gonna start up here in the left-hand corner. Um, this is uh, rose-breasted grosbeak, male and female. Cerulean warbler, male and female. Baltimore oriole, male and female. Uh, the red bird with the black wings is a scarlet tanager, male and female. You can see the females of both the orioles and the tanagers have a little bit of the color, um, but it's a different color than the male. So in the orioles, it's much more yellow, lighter orange. In the uh, tanagers, it's yellow. Um, and then this is a Blackburnian warbler. And these guys are kind of flame orange under the throat, um, the males are, and the females have yellow, but they don't have that really striking orange, deep orange color that the males have. Um, so they're much less conspicuous than the males. Um, and so, you know, color can be a really useful tool 
um, but sometimes, you know, it's not going to help. And so that's when we really do have to fall back on field marks. Um, and I know that these are confusing um, and there's lots of technical sounding names in here like supercilium and auriculars and primaries and secondaries and all of these kinds of things. Um, they are important. I, and I, I can't, I don't want these to be the first thing that you go to um, because I think all of the other things that we talked about uh, up until now are things that are going to help you. And in a lot of cases, as I said, you may not have to go to this level of detail for identifying a bird, but there are gonna be times when you do have to go to this level of detail and it really matters. So these terms really help us have a common language to talk about which part of the bird are we describing when we're talking about where something is. Um, these are, you know, hypothetical birds colored in just to make you aware of where the differences in the color, you know, in the, the parts of the, the bird are. Um, but the color of the breast can be different than the color of the belly, which can be different than the co color under the tail. Um, and so you might have a bird that's got kind of a black breast or a bib on its black breast and a white belly and then a rusty undertail part or whatever. Um, and so learning where those parts of the bird are, are going to help you <laughs> key in on that ID using your own field guide. Or if you're on a walk with somebody and they say, look at, excuse me, the eye ring of the bird, and you know what they're talking about, or the um, crown stripes and the eyebrow, those types of things. Um, so the eyebrow in this case is the, the red part here over the top of the eye versus the eye line, which comes off the back of the eye. And those are often different colors in birds, especially sparrows. And so that fine level of detail becomes really important. Now, I'm not gonna go through all of these. Um, these kinds of images of the parts of a bird are almost always in the front of a field guide. And so, and they use different colors and they, they might use slightly different terms, but for the most part, they're about the same. So I really encourage you to get a field guide and we're gonna talk more about field guides in a minute, but have a field guide look at your field guide, read the introductory sections of the field guide, because that's going to help you learn this kind of stuff. Um, my just stay, sitting here saying it isn't necessarily going to embed it in your brain, and it's something that you need to look at and then go look at a couple of the birds in the field guide and say, okay, yes, I see that bird has an eye ring, or I see that that bird has, you know, a black eye line and a white eyebrow, um, or vice versa, those kinds of things. And so, it's really something that, you know, I encourage people, truly encourage people to study field guides before they go out into the field. And this is why knowing what you can see in your area can be really helpful because now you have that sort of either a printed out list that you've made or a mental checklist of, you know, these are the five or six sparrows that are common in the summer in our area. So I wanna learn those and go study them and read the, the description. Um, so one thing I do want to talk about, because this can often be really confusing, and so I'm not going to spend any more time on specific field marks, but I am going to talk about um, how birds' wings fold, because this is something that if you've ever heard or you saw in those diagrams, we talk about primary feathers and secondary feathers and coverts. You need to know what those are. <laughs> to know where to look on a bird. So that's something that can be really helpful. So I said we were gonna revisit the cedar waxwing. So here's our friend, the cedar waxwing in flight. And I've marked on this bird um, where the primaries are. So the primaries are these outer roughly 10 feathers. Um, and you don't need to know how many there are, but basically from the tip of the wing, the, out, the edge of the wing you know, in are the primaries about halfway down the wing, roughly, is where the secondaries start. So all of these wings that feathers that have these tiny little red dots on the end, that's it's actually the wax, part of the wax wing. Um, 
these are the secondaries. And then the coverts are all the feathers that cover the wing. So if you look very carefully here, you can see two layers of feathers. You can see a short layer that ends right here where my pointer is, and then the longer feathers that stick out underneath. Now, that's a bird in flight. What happens to those feathers when a bird closes its wings? So here's our cedar waxwing, and it's now sitting on a branch. So we'll start at the top of the wing. So now the coverts are basically kind of what we can think of as the shoulder, in essence. Um, the secondaries are stacked one on top of each other underneath those feathers and sticking out from the coverts. And then the primaries are stacked one on top of each other. That's how the wing folds up underneath the secondaries. And so this, where my pointer is, it's kind of hard to see, and I apologize. This feather right here that's kind of bumping up against the tail, this is the first primary. So it's this flight feather out here. So the front part of the wing is what kind of ends up on the bottom when the feathers are stacked. And why this is important is because um, this is often where wing bars are between the primaries and secondaries, between the secondaries and the coverts. And so if you know what sections of the wings they are, when you read in a field guide, you know, that yeah. this is where there's two wing bars in the secondaries or something like that, you know where to look um, to, to see that on a bird. And those are probably some of the really critical things in terms of technical detail um, that's helpful to understand. Um, and I talked about field marks being important. So real quick, the again, here's our friend the cedar waxwing, but he's got a cousin who looks very similar at first glance. Um, both of these birds are found in the same habitats. They eat the same things. They have very similar behaviors. They make similar sounds and they're often found together. So it's really easy to overlook um, them. The one on the left is a cedar waxwing. It has white undertail coverts. So it's kind of hard to see in this picture, but the feathers under the tail are white. It's got a pale yellow belly and it's got these red tips on the secondaries. His cousin over here is the Bohemian waxwing, which can occasionally be here in the winter. Um, it, on the other hand, has rusty undertail coverts. It has a white belly or pale gray belly. Um, it has white patches on both its primary feathers and its secondary feathers. And it also has yellow on the primary tips. So again, very fine levels of details, largely related to where things show up on the wings which is why understanding some of those technical terms and, and how wings sort of align themselves when a bird is sitting versus when they're in flight can help you um, make those identifications and the things that you wanna be looking for. So, um, and again, this is also a, another one of those, when are you in time? Because if you're in June, I can pretty much guarantee you're not seeing Bohemian waxwings here in the watershed or anywhere in the Philadelphia region. Um, they are a bird of Northern Canada and very rarely come down here in the winter. Uh, so if it's January uh, and there's a large flock of cedar waxwings, you might wanna take an extra special look and take some time and see if you can find a bird that has these rusty undertail coverts uh, and the big white patches on its wings. And, and you just might get a Bohemian waxwing in there. Okay, this is the last slide before questions. So if you have questions, throw them in the chat. Um, so learning calls and songs, as I mentioned before, and somebody asked a question about it, very important. Um, you will, I'm gonna say see <laughs> so many more birds if you learn songs and calls. And so um, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this because if you go to our webpage, there is a workshop from a couple of weeks ago, learning bird song. Um, same thing like this, it was a video, it was recorded, it's all on there. Um, and if you watch that and still have any other questions, please let me know. Um, but that was you know, a whole other hour, so I don't wanna spend a lot of time on it um, in this presentation. Uh, but it is there for you as a resource. So 
um, and it is something that's very important and will really help aid in your identification. So I'm going to stop here for questions. Uh, let me open up the chat and see what we've got. Um, okay, for, first question, uh, recommending a specific field guide for beginners. I'm going to talk about that uh, in the next section. Um, yeah, as somebody's got their microphone not muted, so if everybody could sort of double check and uh, make sure they're on mute, um, that would be awesome. And somebody says, sorry, join late. Um, yeah, the, there's going to be the video will go online um, within a week. It'll be up on our web page, so you can um, uh, view the whole video from the beginning. um how to set up how far from the house to set up feeders so they don't okay i'm going to talk about feeding um in the last section and i can touch on that one um so okay um, please feel free as i said if there's any other questions that come up uh in the course of this um jot them in there and we'll stop again after the next section um to take questions so All right, we're having the pause before the advancing of the slides. Okay, field guides. So, I honestly have no idea how I got a like squiggle down my page and I'm really sorry if you can all see that because I do not know how to get rid of it. Um, my apologies. The field guides, so I don't necessarily have one that I recommend for beginners, um, but some thoughts I can give you. Um, I would recommend that if you're really a, a very beginning beginner, that you focus on a field guide that only covers birds of Eastern North America. So like the Sibley guide. Um, and the Sibley guide is actually probably one of the sort of premier go-to guides right now that I would recommend to anybody, whether you're a beginner or not. Um, you can buy a volume that is all of North America from a Sibley guide, but it's kind of, it's a, an at home kind of a guide. It's not a carry in your pocket, in the field, in your backpack type of a thing. His split of the East and West birds is, excuse me, so you can easily fit the East into a large coat pocket or in your backpack and that kind of thing and carry it around for the day. And the only reason I suggest beginners start with only the East is because it just limits your vision. Um, so for example, for some species of warblers where there are some similar Western species, it just helps you get rid of that confusion. Flycatchers is another one. There are a lot of flycatchers that look very, very similar. And if you get rid of the Western species out of your field guide and only carry an Eastern field guide, you now have less than half of the very similar looking flycatchers to deal with when you're trying to make an identification. So focus on something that's um, for Eastern if you are an, a very novice birder. Um, if you are a little bit more advanced, you're potentially interested in subspecies or rarities, um, or doing traveling, then you might want to consider a bird that covers, a guide that covers all of North America um, as an option. I actually like to recommend that people have two field guides, so because they often compare to each other, and if you're going to do that, I suggest that you get one that's got drawings, which is like the Sibley guide or the National Geographic guide or even the Peterson guide, but if you, versus getting one that has photos in it. So like this Kaufman guide to birds of North America, even though this has all of the birds of North America, he uses photos and not drawings. And some people like one versus the other. I like being able to compare them, to be honest with you. The photos are sort of more like what you see in the field um, versus the drawings, but the drawings can be more, 
detailed in terms of the things that the artist chooses to include to highlight certain field marks, for example. Um, in all cases, whether somebody uses photos for the most part or whether somebody uses drawings, most field guides are kind of composites. So they're giving you a view of the average bird. So like when I said the house finches have a ton of variability in the male house finches in their color, um, a field guide isn't going to show you all of that variability. That's something that you're going to have to see in the field. The field guide is going to kind of give you an average representation of a house finch, which is why the house finch and the purple finch often look very, very similar in a field guide. Um, so again, something to just keep in mind. The other thing to keep in mind is portability. If you want to keep it in your pocket, you need to get something that's a little bit easier to carry around, like the Sibley Guide or the Kaufman Guide. Um, I like the Peterson Guide and I like the National Geographic Guide. I actually own all of these field guides because that's what I do, but <laughs> that's just me. Um, the Peterson Guide used to be a great guide to throw in your pocket. They now have made it so big, it won't fit in any pocket. And it's big to carry in a backpack even. Um, it's heavy and it's, there's you know lighter options out there. So again, keep that in mind. The other thing to think about is electronic versions. Um, Sibley Guide is on, there's an app for that. And, the, and then there's also a free Audubon app that is a field guide on your phone. Um, and those can be really, really helpful because, so the Sibley guide, you have to pay for it. It's not free and it costs just as much as the field guide does, but it gives you all of North America and it gives you all the songs. So you have song references on your phone that you could listen to, you can study from at home, and you don't have to buy anything else to give you examples of those songs. So that can be really, really helpful. The other thing about the electronic versions of the field guide is that it can help you, you can, for almost all of them, you can limit um, what geography you're in. So some of them are only like as general as I'm in Pennsylvania or I'm in Northeastern America, but then you can also pick like it's the month, it's May or it's June. Um, and be very specific about that. And the field guide will automatically filter the likely species of birds for you in the electronic version. So that can be really, really helpful. Um, I'm partial to paper books. I always will be, I always have been. So I like to have paper field guides to study from at home, but I really do like the portability of the electronic versions. Um, to be able to have on my phone, it makes it easier to take around. Um, and I actually have both versions. I have Sibley and I have Audubon on my phone because Sibley does drawings and Audubon does pictures. And so those are um, great options, uh, you know, to use. Um, and if you're comfortable just doing everything on your phone, I would actually recommend that you get the electronic version because then you get the songs as well. Um, and for just starting out, I'd go with the free Audubon one, um, but then also seriously consider the Sibley as a comparator um, to have as well. As I said earlier, read the introduction section of your field guide. Uh, it can, contains a lot of useful information, some review of what we've covered here, um, but it also, you know, make sure that the colors that they're using are what you understand. So when you're looking at a range map and you say, oh yeah, okay, it's, that's the summer range or that's the the migration range that, you know, those colors are what you think they mean. Um, and the other thing I have to talk about in terms of field guides, because this can be really confusing to beginners, is how field guides are organized. Um, field guides are organized by taxonomy, which literally just means things are grouped together by genetics. So things that are more closely genetically related to each other are grouped together. So as a general rule, all of the warblers are related to each other. So they're grouped together, but they're different from the sparrows. And the sparrows are closely related to each other. So they're all grouped together, but they're in different parts of the field guide. 
And this can be really frustrating for beginners as you're thumbing through a field guide and, and trying to figure out where things are and like how to find things in your field guide, um, which again is one of the reasons why I suggest that you take the time to page through it at home frequently until you get familiar with sort of that taxonomy um, of things and how things are grouped. Because a lot of times I have beginners say to me, why don't they put like all the red birds together or all the blue birds together or, um, and there actually are some beginning field guides that do that. Um, and that can be helpful to a point, but eventually if you expand and keep, keep birding and keep learning, you're going to outgrow that system actually relatively quickly. And so think of it like this. Um, not all warblers are yellow. A lot of them have yellow on them somewhere, um, but they're not all yellow. So if you had all the yellow birds grouped together, you're not going to have all the warblers together. You're going to have some warblers that are more blue, and you're going to have some warblers that are yellow, and some warblers that are more black. And you know they're not all going to be together. But all the warblers actually kind of have similar body types, similar bill shapes, similar behaviors. So in the long run, learning to recognize that a bird is a warbler is much more useful than learning to learn all the yellow birds. Um, because when you're in the field and you're faced with something that you don't know what it is, learning those big family groupings like warblers or sparrows or flycatchers helps you make that first level categorization. And so that taxonomy can really be useful. And I know it's frustrating, um, just stick with it because eventually it will make sense and you will start to see um, in the field as you see more birds, you're going to realize, oh yeah, I get it. I see how the bills are similar. I see how their behaviors are similar. Um, and, and it will help key you in on what you're seeing when you find an unknown. Um, yeah, spend time with the birds and uh, what's the other thing about, oh, taxonomy. Taxonomy changes. And this is probably one of the most frustrating things to all birders, not just beginning birders. So um, there are a number of taxonomy committees that exist across the world and in our country, and, and it doesn't matter the details, but um, know that as we learn more about birds, um, we learn more about their taxonomy. So for example, birds, all the falcons, like the peregrine falcon, American kestrel, the merlin, they all used to be in a field guide grouped with hawks. So close to the red-tailed hawks, um, close to, excuse me, the red-shouldered hawks, and all, they were all together with the eagles and everything like that. And they've done a lot of genetic work and now discovered that taxonomically speaking, falcons are much closely, more closely related to woodpeckers. So now all the new versions of the field guides that are coming out have all of the falcons after the woodpeckers and they're separate from the hawks which again can be kind of confusing um, just understand that's how it works <laughs> and um, if you use the electronic versions of guides it kind of limits that a little bit um, because it mostly just shows things in an alphabetical order or you can force it to show you things in an alphabetical order but I do encourage you to learn a little bit of the taxonomy and start to understand those groupings of birds because it really will help you um, in the future. So um, the other thing that I can make, so if you're using your grandfather's field guide, that's fine. The birds themselves probably haven't really changed. Some of the names may have changed and the taxonomy is probably very different from a modern field guide. So if you're using an older field guide to compare to a newer field guide for whatever reason, know that some of the bird names themselves may have changed and they may be found in different orders um, in the book. But your grandfather's field guide will actually still help you identify birds because the birds themselves haven't really changed, um, just what we're calling them. And then as we discussed in the beginning, the other thing I can say about field guides is don't spend your time 
flipping through your field guide in the field. Watch the bird. Take notes as, as best you can. Say it out loud like I talked about in the beginning because the more you look at the bird and talk about what you're seeing and put names to the parts of the bird, the much easier time that you're going to have when you do go dive into that field guide to try to figure out what you saw or take your notes from afterwards. Um, so if you really want to challenge yourself, leave your field guide at home. Don't look at the field guide on your phone when you're out there. Take notes about all the birds you don't know and come back to your house and say, how many can I identify from my notes? Because I guarantee you that if you can't identify a few of them, the next time you're out in the field and, and say, for example, the difference comes down to the color of the bird's legs or whether or not the bird had wing bars or had one wing bar or two wing bars, I guarantee you that the next time that you're in the field, you are gonna pay attention to that level of detail in a way that you never did before because you couldn't figure out what birds you saw. So that's a really good way of challenging yourself um, moving forward. Another tool that out there is um, the Merlin Bird ID app. This is a free app that you can put on your phone um, and it is essentially an electronic field guide, but instead of flipping pages, um, it provides the pages to you based on the answers to the questions of like, and it takes into consideration what time of the year it is, where you are in location, because it geolocates you um, on a map in the app and it asks you what size the bird was and you pick that scale from house sparrow to, to uh, Canada goose. It asks you to select one to three main colors of the bird and it asks you what was the bird doing, whether it was eating at a feed or swimming or waiting on the ground in the trees or bushes, you know, that kind of stuff. And you pick one and you click next and it gives you a list of possibilities based on your time and location and your answers to these questions. So, it is essentially filtering things. Um, your mileage may vary. Some people I know absolutely love this app. Some people I know absolutely detest this app for a variety of reasons. Um, it's free, give it a try. It can't hurt. But again, like using a field guide, I recommend that you spend as much time as you can looking at the bird and still taking notes, doing, um, you know, or saying it out loud, what you were seeing, because these are very generic questions. You see, they're very basic questions. So it's going to give you a list of possibilities, but it's still going to give you a list of six brown birds with rufous caps, like our earliest example. It has that potential depending on the bird that you're seeing. So you're still going to have to be able to take it to that next level of identification um, to be sure that that's what you saw. So it can still help you filter, but you still need to pay attention to those details because it's gonna give you a list of, of options. Um, all right, I see a bunch of questions pop up. So I'm just gonna take a look real quick um, before I go on and see if there's anything here. Um, okay, does one need to update field guidebooks often or not necessarily? So, yeah, it depends on the field guide, to be honest with you. So like Kaufman's field guide, he never, I don't, he might be on the second edition of that field guide. He hasn't done any further updates beyond that. So in fact, in his field guide, um, the, the Falcons may still be with the Hawks, uh, for example. But um, the National Geographic is on its seventh printing. Now they save up a lot of, of um, changes. So taxonomic changes, name changes. And the other thing that they'll change when they change a field guide is range maps. So a lot of people who are writing field guides are using eBird actually to get much more detailed range maps that they can put into their field guide. So they're much more specific and they're much more up to date. Um, but they save those up for a while. So field guides do not come out as a new edition that often. Um, maybe every couple of years, and even at that, it really depends on the field guide. So it's not necessary to, to 
change them often. Um, and that's also why having an app version of it can be really useful because they can push an update to the app and make it more current or update um, information about specific species much faster than you can um, uh, do it in a printed book. So yeah, Merlin ID app, bird ID app, um, and it's free. This is the logo here, what it looks like um, on um, the app store and it's provided by Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And as I said, your mileage may vary, but again, it's a, it's a good place to start. Um, Cornell Lab of Ornithology is a great organization to follow. They have tons of information about birds and bird identification. Um, so yeah, it's a great place to dive in um, and learn a lot of the things that I covered in here in terms of habitat and size and shape and pattern color comes from how they teach bird identification um, because it's a way that's just, it's sort of an easy way to to uh, present a, a rather difficult topic. So um, nothing that I'm talking about here uh, would be hugely dramatically different from the learning stuff that they have on their website. They actually also have some courses um, in bird identification, bird song identification that you can actually pay for, go through at your own pace, they're all based online. Um, again, something if you're interested in taking things to a next level, um, those are options that are out there all on the Cornell Lab of Ornithology page. And we're stuck again. Okay, um, just a brief mention about next level field guides. There are lots of options out there for groups of birds that we tend to think of as more difficult or more complicated in terms of identification. Um, so things like shorebirds or gulls or sparrows, um, you can get field guides and I say field guides. None of these books are designed to be carried into the field. I mean, the Sparrows one is actually like a decent sized hardback book, um, but it's a really good book about sparrows. So um, again, just next level um, for things that you might be interested in. I will say the Warbler Guide is available as an app. Um, I know for iPhone, I don't know if it's on Android, um, but if it is, I highly recommend that you buy, again, for the reason that the songs are included, buy the app version of it if you're going to spend the money on the Warbler Guide. It is an incredible guide. It really is going to help you learn warblers. And if you buy the app version of it, all the songs are built in, which is a really, really useful tool. Um, and, you know, these books can be really helpful because... Um, in, a, in any given field guide, there's a very limited amount of space. I mean, field guides are really designed to be carried into the field with you, to help you in, in identification while you're out there. And so there's a very limited amount of information and there's a limited number of pictures of every bird that they can put in and, and each species account is, is rather small. So the beauty of books like these is that they, they get you to that next level. They're, they're because they're dedicated on just one thing like sparrows or warblers, they have much more room for expanded species accounts. So really helps you learn more in detail about some of those species. Um, but they can also really help you in terms of identification in ways that you might not think of. So like, for example, the Hawks in Flight book, a lot of field guides present seeded pictures of birds. So they're perched on this hypothetical tree branch and, and they're all in brilliant, brilliant color as much as hawks are in color, but they do have a lot of color to them when you see them in good light perched on a tree. But that's not often how we see hawks. We see hawks up in the air. And especially in our area, if you spend any time well, Fort Washington State Park has a hawk watch, Hawk Mountain, down in Cape May. 
hawks are flying. And when hawks are up in the air, they lose a lot of that color. So actually a lot of the drawings and pictures that they have in the Hawks in Flight book that I re reference here are in black and white because you lose that color when they're up in the air. And unless you had a book like this that explained that rationale and said, this is why we're doing this in black and white, you wouldn't really understand it. And so it's very helpful to look at birds in a different way than they're presented in just a field guide. Um, the shorebirds, for example, are often found in mixed flocks at the edges of mudflats and, and feeding. And so there might be five or six species of birds in that mixed flock. And how do you learn how to pick out what birds are what out of a mixed flock? And the shorebird guide has pictures of those mixed flocks and can go through a discussion about that and compare one to another where a field guide is just gonna have each of those six species listed separately and you're not gonna get that comparison. So that's why books like this can be really helpful um, if you're interested in taking things to that next level. There's also what I'm gonna term as sort of field guide supplements and these kind of fall into three categories. So these four over here on the left-hand side of the screen are kind of things about focused on sort of how to bird. So they take a lot of the concepts that I've presented here today and take them to the next level in terms of putting them to um, broad categories of birds. So they don't necessarily go through each species, but they'll talk about ducks and they'll talk about, you know, dabbling ducks like mallards and ducks that tip up to feed um, off the bottom of a, a pond versus the ducks that dive all the way under the water. And they'll divide those into two categories and kind of talk about the generalities of those and learning IDs around those things. So these can be um, kind of really useful from that perspective. Um, and they talk about things more on a holistic point of view than that species level identification. Again, it helps you create that framework for um, understanding the, the basics of, of that. Um, the two on the left over here are more about sort of natural history kinds of things. How many eggs, how type of nest, uh, behaviors, migration, those kinds of things. So if you're interested in learning more about birds um, and the kinds of information that's not often included in a field guide, these are two um, really good choices. Um, to think about. Uh, they present information a little bit differently. So if you're really interested in understanding nest types and how many eggs and how long it takes for the eggs to hatch and that type of stuff, um, the Birder's Handbook is the kind of book you want. Uh, if you're more interested in sort of general understanding of birds, the one on the bottom, the Sibley Guide to Bird Life and Behavior is where you want to be. And then this last book is essentially a field guide without any pictures in it. I know that sounds really weird. Um, but it is a really useful book to supplement your field guide uh, because he takes, it's, it's a massive tome, um, uh, and he takes each species that's in North American field guides and has a, species, a, a much more in-depth species account. He talks about what birds um, that bird might be found in, in certain circumstances like migration or um, birds that it might breed near. And so it's just a whole other level of detail of information. Um, I know that that one is available as an ebook as well. It, again, it's not something that's going to help you in the field identify, um, but to have, you know, an electronic version of it that you can use when you're looking at your field guide uh, can be really helpful. Okay, I'm gonna stop for questions here really quickly before we go in and see if there's any more in here. Um, okay, not seeing any yet. So um, binoculars is our next, my slides would change. Okay, choosing binoculars. So binoculars are sold with two numbers on them. Um, 
the first number is the magnification number. So how many times something is magnified? Seven, eight, eight and a half, ten. Um, and that, in addition to the magnification level, that also impacts your field of view. So example here, uh, the picture on the left is a lower magnification. So say seven, for example, um, and you can see it's got this wider field of view versus the one on the right. Let's say that's a 10 magnification. Um, it's got a narrower field of view. For beginning birders, I would recommend that you stick down in the eight, eight and a half range or sevens if you find binoculars that are comfortable for you. Um, having that wider field of view is going to be more helpful than having the slightly higher magnification level because it's already hard enough to find birds in binoculars. And when you have that much narrower field of view at like a 10x binocular, it's even harder to find birds in the binoculars. So um, think of having something with a little bit more, a uh, uh, little bit less magnification and, and get that field of view. The second number is the size of the objective lens. So the end, end lens here as um, you're looking through the binoculars, it's the, the, the last lens um, in the line. And the size of the binoculars, the size of the objective lens really correlates to brightness um, through the binoculars and low light performance. So um, a 32 is gonna be less bright than a 42. Um, all other things being equal. Now, there are some other things that um, impact that as well. So, and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, yeah, so most binoculars, these are kind of the four sort of, I'm gonna say typical binoculars that the vast majority of birders use. Um, anything beyond 10 by 42s start to get too heavy to comfortably carry into the field for any length of time. And the heavier a binocular is, um, the more it's going to shake. You're going to have natural shake um, from your own arms, and that shake is only going to get worse as a day goes on or the more time that you're out in the field with that binoculars as you get tired. So um, 10 by 42s are kind of like the, the max limit for most people in terms of comfortable carryability um, in the field. Another specification that you want to pay attention to uh, if you wear eyeglasses is you want to look at the number in the specification that's given for eye relief. And you want that to be about 15 to 20 millimeters if you wear eyeglasses. Um, if you wear eyeglasses, what happens is because of your glasses, your eyes are further away from the actual lens of the binoculars. And Good binoculars that have a, what's called a high level of eye relief account for that. And so they make it easier for eyeglass wearers to see through the binoculars um, and so that they don't get headaches from the binoculars. So if you, if you have binoculars that you're using now and you can't get rid of the um, black on the edges of the binoculars or you constantly get a headache when you use them, they probably don't have enough eye relief for you. Um, so you might want to think about getting something different. Um, close focusing is not something that's critical. It's usually given in feet in terms of a specification. Um, there's not really a right or wrong here. Um, what it's going to impact is how close you can see a bird through your binoculars. So if you have something that focuses um, to six feet, that's you know, a bird's going to have to be at least six feet away from you before you can focus on it. Now, for most birds, that's not a problem. And if they're closer than that, most of us can see enough with our eyes that it's not really going to matter. Um, where it does become an issue is if, for example, you're interested in looking more as well at butterflies or dragonflies or things like that. Um, oftentimes, they can end up being much closer than six feet, for example. So you might want something that has a closer focusing distance. Um, but again, no right or wrong here, just something to pay attention to um, in the specifications um, when you're looking at binoculars. Ergonomics of binoculars are really important. And so, um, I don't generally recommend that you buy a purchase, purchase binoculars without having an opportunity to try them out a little bit. Um, everybody's hands are a little bit different. Everybody's eyes are a little bit different. So what feels comfortable and good for me might not feel comfortable and good for you. 
And it's the only way you're gonna know that is to go someplace that has a bunch of different binoculars and be able to stand in a window and try them and see if you can adjust them to your eyes and how they feel in your hands and all of those kinds of things. Um, how close they come together. If your eyes are really close together like mine are, um, I had to get binoculars that could, you know, get that close. Um, and I was trying out some that are really good binoculars when I was buying the ones I have now that I couldn't use because they didn't close co close enough um, to, to um, be comfortable for my eyes. So again, you really just need to try them out. Um, price is something that people always ask about. And honestly, you know, the price can go from $150 to $2,000 plus. Um, you do get what you pay for. Um, the more money that you spend, generally speaking, you get higher quality build, so they'll last you longer. You get better glass, which impacts the brightness, um, the low light performance, the color rendition. So sometimes really inexpensive binoculars um, don't represent colors as well as the higher end binoculars do. Again, people bird with all different ranges of binoculars. So it's something that if you're in the market for, you have to figure out what you're willing to spend first and then go try binoculars in that price range. Uh, because I can guarantee you more or less that if you try the very high-end binoculars without saying, I'm not willing to spend that much money, you will want the high-end binoculars because they generally are that much better. Um, that being said, I, I have a pair of binoculars that I use that are in the $400 range that are just wonderful. Um, so, you know, it, it just, it's a matter of what you're willing to, to spend. Unfortunately, I, oh, I want to show this. If you go online to the Audubon, just search Audubon gear binocular guide, you, they have a whole series of things that they've tested all different levels, all different price ranges of binoculars. And they have them categorized by, you know, entry level binoculars and then the really high end and everything in the middle. And it'll give you some models, it'll give you some information, it'll give you the reviews of what their reviewers thought about the ergonomics of things and all that kind of stuff. So if you really have no idea what you want, that may be a really good place to sort of start and get an idea of, okay, I'm willing to spend this much money, you know, these are the features that I'm looking for and all that kind of stuff. I really like butterflies, so close focus and distance is important to me. I wear eyeglasses, so I have to get something with good eye relief, those kinds of things. That article, it's actually a series of articles, um, will be a really good start and has way much more detail than I could ever present um, to you tonight. Unfortunately for us, there's not really a good local place to go try out a lot of binoculars. Um, the best place that I can say without reservation is Cape May Bird Observatory. Um, they have a couple of different centers for um, stores where they sell binoculars. One is down basically on the point. Um, there's another one down along the Delaware Bay Shore that's not open all the time. None of them are open right now, so just keep that in mind. Um, but if you really need to try something out, they have staff that are trained. They have binoculars that are in stock that are designed for birders at a variety of different price ranges and you can go, you can handle them all, you can take them outside of their shop and watch at their bird feeders, you can look through the windows, and you can get a really good sense of sort of what, what things are like. Um, I'm gonna, you can try, um, you know, sporting goods stores and that kind of thing um, more locally, but oftentimes they don't have a great variety of different kinds of models and they, they may be geared more towards hunting than birding. And there are a little bit of differences, um, mostly in the power and the magnification. Again, think about, you know, a lot of times hunters are sitting in one place. They're not walking in a field. So, you know, you need to kind of keep that in mind in terms of looking at that difference. So think about that. Um, my one soapbox moment <laughs> for a second is if you're going to go to Cape May Bird Observatory and use the staff, 
to help you work through some of the binoculars choices, please buy your binoculars there. Um, don't come home and try to find them cheaper on the web. They are, their prices really are competitive. Um, their profit margins are razor thin to begin with. And just like our organization, they are a nonprofit. And so any little bit of support that we can give them um, also goes to help the birds and bird conservation um, for them. And so, you know, if you're gonna use them, buy them there. Um, the other thing, and they have a fall weekend, a fall festival and a spring festival. So pay attention on their websites. Again, right now, everything's kind of up in the air, um, but they do have those on an ongoing basis and they have a trade show with that. Um, and they have all manner of um, optics manufacturers come to that, those weekends. And so you can go to, you don't have to go down for the walks or anything like that, although you certainly could, but you can go to the, the expo that they have and see all of the different um, optics manufacturers and try them out and that kind of stuff. So that's another option as well to keep your eyes open for. Um, the other thing is I can recommend once we get through COVID and we're all back to being able to go on bird walks with each other, um, talk to folks about what binoculars they're using, what they like about them, what they don't like about them. Ask them if you can look through them. Birders are generally a pretty friendly lot and if you explain that you're looking for binoculars and you're just trying to get a sense of what things look like or feel like and that kind of stuff, most birders are gonna be willing to let you take a, a gander through their binoculars um, while you're out on a bird walk. So yeah, once we get through these times, um, you know, give that a try. Um, so I've got, I saw some questions popping up. I've got one more slide about using binoculars and then I'm gonna to get to questions. So I can't get into a lot of details about this because each set of binoculars is a little bit different, but down here on this bottom here, you'll see um, all these little numbers. This is the diopter settings. And in this case, you pull the knob out and you can adjust the diopter settings to your eyes. Basically, each one of our eyes focuses a little bit differently, and this allows us to set that focus to account for any differences in our eyes. So when you get binoculars, um, or if you have some at home that you think are not great, look up the, the um, model that you have, excuse me, online, if you don't have the book anymore or whatever, and learn how to set the diopter for the binoculars that you have and make those adjustments for your own eyes because it's, that's really gonna help you be able to see things in focus um, when you're looking through them and is absolutely a key when you get new, new optics um, to set the diopter. And double check it over time. If you get a new prescription in your glasses or you go from not wearing glasses to having to wear glasses, you may need to change the diopter on your binoculars. So keep that in mind. Um, if this piece, right here, uh, the black on the little white tube, this is the eyepiece. Um, these eye cups need to be up if you do not have glasses on and they need to be down if you have glasses on. So that's gonna help the, the lens of the binocular be the appropriate distance from your eye, um, depending on whether or not you have glasses on. So yeah, eye cups up um, if you don't wear glasses, eye cups down if you wear glasses. And all binoculars flex around that middle pivot point. So adjust the barrels to be close or far apart based on the distance of your own eyes. And basically the guide for that is you don't wanna see any black edges along the edge of the binoculars. Um, and as I said, if you've got them all the way squeezed in as close as the, the barrels will go and you're still seeing black edges, those binoculars probably are not close enough for your eyes and you might need to think about getting something different. Um, but try adjusting them in and out until you don't see those black edges. And the biggest tip that I can give you if you are just beginning, finding birds in binoculars is hard. And so I understand it's frustrating, stick with it, keep practicing. The best tip I can give you is to find the bird with your eyes first, and then bring your binoculars up without moving your head or your eyes. Don't take your eyes off that bird. Just bring the binoculars up and put them in front of your face and then move your focus wheel if you need to. Um, if you take your eyes away from that bird, especially in the beginning, as you're learning to use binoculars and getting more comfortable with them, 
um, you, if you take your eyes off that bird to find your binoculars and pull them up, you will not be able to find that bird once you bring the binoculars up because your field of vision has just narrowed so much. Um, it's really hard to see. So that's the biggest tip I can give you in terms of using binoculars. I'm going to stop here for questions. Okay, go back up here. Um, the app that comes with songs. Okay, so there's a couple. Um, either the Sibley guide, the field Sibley field guide has songs built in. The Audubon field guide has songs built in, and then the Warbler guide has songs built in. Um, if I were to plant new trees in the backyard, any ones that birds would like. I'm going to defer on that question. If you go on our website, there are a couple of webinars that um, Cindy Nuss from Wincote Audubon gave a couple of weeks ago um, with very much more specific kinds of things about um, actual plants and trees for your backyard for birds and pollinators. So um, I would recommend that you go take a look at those um, in the interest of time for tonight. Um, selection, Nikon, yeah, Nikon's a good brand of binoculars. Um, and there's a lot out there again. So yeah, it, you just have to try and look and see, um, you know, um, what's going to work for your eyes um binoculars have a third number five point, okay so the the 5.5 degrees is really um if i remember correctly it that relates to the angle of the field of view um and it's just a measure of how they took that field of view um it's not as important as the magnification number in terms of of um, the particular specs for birding. Um, oh, the binocular store. So it's Cape May Bird Observatory and it's their Northwood Center. Um, it's down near the lighthouse in Cape May. Uh, you would have, and I know it's not open right now for sale, but you would have to um, uh, keep an eye on when they're gonna reopen. Um, and be available to go try out binoculars. And yes, indeed, they are doing a virtual optic sale this weekend. Um, again, I, that's great if you know what you want, but if you need the opportunity to actually put some things in your hands and feel them, um, and the virtual optic sale isn't gonna help you um, very much. So, but yeah, they are doing a virtual optic sale this weekend. So um, that's another option as well. Um, Nikon Monarch S, yeah, I have a pair of Nikon Monarchs as well, um, are ones that I really like. Um, they're kind of my small travel binoculars and they're great, um, really comfortable, um, pretty good quality for the price that they were. So I was, I was highly impressed. Um, We're stuck again. Okay. Um, I'm going to start talking and hopefully this is going to switch the slide. So just in the interest of time, um, I just wanted to touch on some real general bird friendly guidelines. Um, as I said, Cindy Nuss from Wincote Audubon Society did um, a couple of lectures about bird friendly backyards and pollinator plants. And a lot of the pollinator plants are actually it sounds weird, but a lot of the pollinator kinds of plants can also be good bird plants um, because while they're, the flowers are good for pollinators, the fruit or the seeds that they make can be good for the birds on the other end. So um, I encourage you, if you didn't sit for her presentations, um, you might want to give those a try. And we're stuck. So um, yes, Somebody mentioned in the comments, choose native trees, and that's absolutely true. Um, go native. Um, if you need further recommendations beyond what Cindy gives, um, I suggest taking a look at Bowman's Hill Wildflower Preserve. They have lots of resources um, for trees and, and plants that are native to our area. Um, and even Penn State Extension 
um, for this area. There's a lot of stuff out there about what's native for here um, and things that are bird friendly. Um, work to reduce uh, invasive species in your yard as much as possible. Um, they just don't tend to provide as much benefit for the birds. Um, and they also don't provide as much benefit for the insects. And insects are important for a lot of reasons in terms of pollination, but insects are also really important for birds. And they're a major source of um, bird food for raising young. So uh, one chickadee nest, one Carolina chickadee nest, needs about 9,000 caterpillars to raise its chicks from the time they hatch out of the egg until the time they leave the nest. And they actually need more than that because the parents will continue to feed them um, in the you know surrounding area around the nest. It's just harder to count. Um, so they need at least 9,000 caterpillars. And one way to significantly increase the number of caterpillars in your yard is to plant native plants that our native insects will use and that the caterpillars will be on that the birds can find. Um, any level of diversity that you can add to your yard, so ground covers, shrubs, trees, and flowering plants, um, that diversity is oft often um, much more useful than only having one or two kinds of things. Um, reducing your lawn is another thing that can go really far in terms of making your yard bird friendly, uh, as well as no chemicals. Again, the no chemicals is gonna prevent, um, keep the insects on your plants. And yes, you may see some holes in your leaves, but it's gonna be much more beneficial for the birds because they're gonna have food to eat um, from those plants. And um, if you can, and I know this is difficult depending on your living situation, but if you can, um, think about providing for all of their needs. So cover or places to raise young, like nest boxes and things for those kinds of species that use them providing food, providing water, um, and think about certifying your yard as a wildlife habitat. Um, in terms of uh, bird-friendly backyards, natural foods are best, again, so plant natives and plant a variety that provide a variety of food. Um, water can be just as important as food, and you can attract species that will come to feeders. So if you have a feeding station, that's great, uh, and that can be a lot of fun. I mean, I love watching the birds in my bird feeder in my backyard. Um, but there's a lot of species of birds that won't come to feeders for whatever reason. And so, but they will come to some of those native trees and shrubs um, and they will come to water. And so um, heat the water in the winter to prevent freezing. Uh, think about getting something that's sort of like this at a ground level. Um, even if you get a, a pedestal kind of a thing, you can ditch the pedestal, just take the basin Birds are actually much more comfortable bathing on the ground than they are up in the air. So um, having something on the ground like this is uh, likely to attract a lot more species. This waterer here has a dripper that's hooked up to a hose um, that just literally drips water. And that dripping sound of water also will attract more species. So um, something to uh, think about in your yard. And then you can put a heater in there to prevent um, the freezing of the water in the winter because birds often need, uh, birds, not often, birds need water in the winter as much as they need it in the summer. Uh, and it's much harder for them to find obviously in the winter because it's all frozen. And then you wanna do things like preventing, uh, preventing window strikes. And there's a lot of information out there online. Um, I will say that the stickers that look like a hawk, you know, kind of a thing, um, don't use those, they don't help. Um, you need things that are spaced like two inches apart, basically. Um, and there's a variety of things that you can get. There's a variety of sticker things that you can put on your a windows that you can't, um, that won't impede your view out of the window because obviously you want to see that. Um, but window strikes are one of the leading causes of death among birds. And so um, things that, you know, if you're making your yard friendly for birds, you want to minimize uh, the potential for them to hit your windows. Um, so I encourage you to look up how to prevent window strikes online and read through some of the options and think about um, what might work best for your particular situation. Um, if you're going to set up a bird feeder, um, and I encourage you to think about doing that, that's great. Again, variety of foods and feeder types is going to attract 
a lot of different kinds of species. Some birds do not want to feed out of a tube feeder, but they'll feed out of a flat platform feeder. Um, so again, that diversity of food and types, heights as well. Um, it's great if you can have some spot nearby that they can land on um, and, and have some level of cover nearby, excuse me, but preferably not too close to um, the, the feeders themselves because then if there's any wild cats in your area, um, they can hide in that cover and basically stalk your feeder um, forever. So, um, you know, give the birds a fighting chance, um, but some cover nearby. Um, somebody asked earlier about how far away to put your feeders. So basically, um, oh, I'm gonna get these numbers wrong. You want it either really close, so like close to your house or close to your windows, so like on the order of four feet or less, or you want it like 12 feet away or 16 feet away. I have to, I have to find the exact numbers. Um, whoever asked that question earlier, if you wouldn't mind sending me an email um, or anybody else that's interested, I will remember to try to find those numbers. Basically, the idea is if you have your feeders close to your house, the birds don't build up enough speed to hit your windows. Like if they hit a window, they're not going at full tilt because they're so close, they haven't gotten up to speed in that middle distance that's where the risk is if you and then if you get it further away they have enough space to maneuver away from the windows particularly if you have the windows marked so they know it's a window and they're not seeing reflections of the trees or thinking that they can fly right through it and that's really what it comes down to um, in terms of the birds being scared or not scared or you know used to humans or not used to humans um, it doesn't really matter. Some birds are going to be more tolerant of people around than others. Um, nuthatches and chickadees and titmice and some woodpeckers will actually learn to eat out of people's hands if you really want to take the time to sit out there with seed in your hand for a long enough period of time. Um, other birds will never come to your hand to do that, um, but they would come to a feeder with nobody in the yard. So I wouldn't worry so much about it from the standpoint of whether the birds will be scared or not. Um, if you go out into the yard, more than likely all the birds are going to scatter. It's more a matter of safety in terms of, um, again, preventing window strikes. So you either want it really close to your house or you want it much further away so that um, they have uh, less of a chance of hitting the windows. If you're going to put feeders up, the one thing that I highly, highly, highly ask of you to do is clean your feeders regularly. Um, Bring them in, empty them out, get rid of old seed regularly. Um, hot water dish soap works really well. They make um, brushes. So if you have like these tube feeders, you can get inside the, the feeder with the brush. A lot of good feeders are completely, um, you can completely take them apart relatively easily. So you can get into all the nooks and crannies. And I'd encourage you to look for feeders like that because it just is clean, cleaner. Um, mold can grow really easily on bird seed that's left outside and that's not good for birds. It can make them sick and so you really want to prevent that. Um, the next level of cleaning, if you've got something that's been contaminated or set outside for a while, you forgot about it or whatever, um, wash it with soap and hot water and then soak it in a bleach solution for about 30 minutes and then rinse it really, really well and let it dry and then rinse it again um, and then fill it with food and put it out. And that's just gonna help kill any bacteria um, that are living in there that could make the birds sick. Um, top 10 foods for winter feeding. We tend to think of fe with feeding as a winter thing and generally that's the time that you're gonna get most of the birds to come. Um, feeding now during the breeding season benefits adult birds uh, more than anything because it gives them a quick place to come and eat food while they're searching for food for their babies because they're much more likely to take babies caterpillars than they are to take them some flowers or peanuts, um, for example. So um, those kinds of things, you know, again, you don't have to feed in the summer. It's not necessary. Um, winter is a great um, opportunity to do that, um, you know, and again, offering a variety of food will increase the species diversity. So um, if you offer mealworms um, 
or fruit, you're likely to get different species than would come to sunflower seeds or peanuts, for example. And hummingbirds is another really easy one to feed, but a couple caveats to that. Please don't use ne nectar mix that contains red dye. You don't need it. Um, the red on the feeder is enough. Uh, it's absolutely critical that you change the nectar daily in hot water, um, hot weather, sorry. Hang the feeder in the shade if that's possible. That'll keep the the um, water, the nectar in the feeder from going bad as quickly. Uh, if you don't have enough hummingbirds coming to consume the whole feeder in one day, which most of us probably don't accept towards migration time, don't fill the feeder all the way. Just fill it, you know, a quarter of the way or halfway um, and sort of watch how much is going in a day. And that's just going to help you not waste the nectar that you've made. That's all. Um, you, you, if you want to reduce bees and wasps, recommend using a feeder with no yellow on the ports. A lot of hummingbird feeders are red and then they have those yellow flowers on them. Those are like a magnet for bees and wasps. If you can get a feeder like this one here that has no yellow on it, you're much likely to have bees and wasps around regularly. You may get a few, but not as many as with the yellow flowers. And then this red contraption here is an ant guard. Um, you hang this, the feeder from the bottom here, the top goes on the post or whatever you're hanging everything from, and it just helps keep ants out of your feeder um, and keeps the feeder a little bit uh, neater for the birds. It's really easy to make your own nectar. You just use boiled hot water um, and sugar and four cups of water to one cup of sugar and that's it. And then store it in the refrigerator. Um, and it will potentially keep for a couple of weeks. Just watch for mold. Um, you can see the mold start growing in it. And if it gets moldy, dump it out, clean out the container that you've sorted in really well and make fresh, excuse me, and uh, just hang, um, hang that and change it daily when it's hot. So that is all I have. I'm sorry I flew through that last part. This took way longer than I thought it was going to. Um, so again, my apologies for that. I know that there are a few more questions that um, popped up here. So um, okay. Bowman's Hill for plants. Yes, that's in uh, the New Hope area. I want to say, I think, I think their mailing address is still New Hope, um, but it's in that area right along um, the Delaware River. Um, they're a great resource for native plants. Um, and they just have a lot of information online. Um, there's a number, number of other places locally that have native plants as well. And I believe that information is on our website as well. Collins Nursery is one that's relatively close to the watershed. Um, she's actually doing, I think she's still doing whatever stock she has, like you can call ahead and order and then do curbside pickup um, for things. So yeah, there's some local sources as well. Um, and I'm pretty sure we have information about that on our website. And I, I'm questioning myself because we just redid our website and I'm not entirely sure what we put back up there. But if you need sources for native plants and you can't find them on our website, email me and I have a bunch of stuff that I can send you. Um, commenting on uh, native trees. I love the fringe tree too. Um, I have one, a couple of those in my backyard and they're gorgeous trees in the spring. Um, they just finished blooming. Uh, in my yard. Sweet Bay Magnolia, Service Berries, yeah, oaks. If you can plant an oak tree in your yard, any kind of oak tree, um, over 500 different insect species that make caterpillars, so like butterflies and moths and some other insects that have a caterpillar phase, use oaks for their caterpillar phase. So oaks are a tremendous source of food um, for birds and produce volumes of pollinating kinds of butterflies and um, moths. So um, if you can plant an oak tree in your yard, plant an oak tree in your yard. Um, you will, as it gets older, uh, you will have um, a great source of food. Any unique bird like migrating warblers that I have seen in my backyard, I have always seen them first in my oak tree. Um, so yeah, oaks are a great native tree. Um, 
Oh, general rule of thumb again for cleaning feeders, how many days, weeks can it sit before cleaning? It really kind of depends and you kind of have to keep a, if the birds are cleaning it out every couple of days and the seeds not sitting in there, then you could probably clean it out once a month. Um, and again, it also depends on how much wet weather we have. Um, but if for some reason the birds aren't eating the food in that, either you don't have that many um, thistle is a really good one for this. If you don't have enough goldfinches coming to eat the thistle and it sits in there, it kind of gets moldy and then they won't eat it. So if you see the feeders not getting emptied, then it's a good idea to go out and check them and see if there's like mold or clumpy old seed in the bottom and then you need to clean it. Um, so you kind of just need to watch it and judge for yourself. Um, I would say if you're actively feeding birds, um, you probably should be trying to clean your feeders once a month. Um, most of us probably aren't quite that committed, but that would be, you know, ideally um, if you could do it then. Um, uh, Redbud Nursery and Media is something else that somebody recommended as a, a native source of plants. So um, that is all I have. Again, my apologies. I did not intend for this to be so long, um, but I hope everybody took some helpful tips away from it. Um, and uh, we will have the recording online. Something, another message just popped up. Um, have the recording online within the week so that you can. Um, uh, take a look, um, you know, go back and refresh yourself. And if you have any questions uh, that you think of um, after we get off, please feel free to email me. Um, and hopefully you can connect with all of us um, at some point in the future on an actual live bird walk and we can put some of these uh, techniques into practice. So uh, thanks everybody for participating. And uh, it was great to see you all. And uh, everybody have a great evening.